It is great to be with you again this evening. You know, God is purposely determined in keeping with man's free will, with his power of choice to bring man into eternal glory. And I don't think anything is more evident than this as we study the biblical history of man's relationship to God. Time and again, we see through that God has born with sinful man, with rebellious man, who really deserve to be eternally condemned. And yet we see God sparing nothing to make possible the salvation of man. Jesus Christ willingly took on him the seed of Abraham, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16. And being made in the likeness of man, he was able to become the faithful and merciful high priest to bring reconciliation to mankind. Now, in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, as Rowdy just read, we see that if we are Christ, then are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. To recognize the import of this very promise here, I want to look at the man called Abraham tonight. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, there is a mention of a promise of inheritance. And the value of a promise lies primarily in the person that is making the promise. In other words, if the person who's making the promise cannot be trusted, then the promise isn't worth a whole lot. But the promise that we are given here in Galatians chapter 3 comes from the God of Abraham. Now this God of Abraham, he's the one who actually spoke to Moses there in the burning bush. And he told Moses, I am the God of thy father and the God of Abraham. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. So let's take our Bibles now and look, go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Now this God of Abraham, of course he is the creator of this universe. He is the only true and living God. He's infinite. He's eternal. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent, he is immutable, and he is perfect in all of his attributes. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 20, the Hebrew writer spoke of this God. Listen to what he said. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul." both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. The God of this promise can certainly be trusted. He is trustworthy. And so we look forward to what he has promised. Now, destined to be the father of the faithful and a friend of God, Abraham was originally called out of the midst of of a place that was rampant with idolatry. He was called from the Ur of the Chaldees. And in this call, he's going to receive exceeding great and precious promises. If you want to take your Bibles and turn over to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we see the promise that God made to Abraham when he called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Look at Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is what we call the Abrahamic promise or the Abrahamic covenant. And as we consider this promise, 
We notice that this promise was given to Abraham not just once, but several times, but also even given to Isaac and also to Jacob. And in this promise, God said several things. Now, in addition to blessing Abraham and giving him a great name, there was a physical seed that would spring from Abraham, and that, of course, would be Isaac. This seed of Isaac then produced the nation of Israel with an accompanying inheritance of the land of Canaan. But even of greater importance than these promises, out of this physical nation arises a spiritual seed, who is Christ, who produced a spiritual nation, which is the church, and gives us a spiritual land inheritance, which would be heaven. Now, the physical seed, nation, and land promise, they have all been fulfilled. There is nothing left to be fulfilled. In fact, God, speaking through Joshua, said to the Jews in Joshua 24, verse 3, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. But the blessings of the spiritual seed and nation and inheritance, and uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the land inheritance, they continue to be fulfilled even today. Now, the basis for Abraham's justification before God was his obedient faith. And it's very important that we understand that according to the Apostle Paul and the inspired writer of James, that this is the basis for our own justification. Our being the spiritual children of Abraham, of course, it is dependent upon the same kind of response toward God that they had, and that is an obedient faith. Now, genuine faith is something that characterized Abraham all throughout his life. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he obeyed, he trusted, he submitted to the very commandments of God even though he did not know what lay in his future. Hebrews 11 verse 9 says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Concerning the promise of a son in his old age, I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul said of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, look at verses 18 through 21. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. Again, this is Paul speaking of Abraham, and he says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. His faith never faltered once, not even when God told him to take Isaac, his son, his only son, and to offer him as a sacrifice upon an altar. By faith, it says that Abraham, he rose up, he went believing that God would raise Isaac from the dead to fulfill his promise, Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. And such is the example of faith for all who seek to be the children of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. You know, the inspired writer James asked the question in James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by faith or by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. You know, there are only two ways that a person can be righteous before God Almighty. Either it has to be 100% faithful, 
or he has to be 100% forgiven. Now, to be totally faithful is to be saved by merit. To be totally forgiven is to be saved by grace. And unless we live totally sinless 100% of the time, then we're going to have to look to grace. Abraham was justified by his obedient faith and it was counted unto him for righteousness, Romans chapter 4, verse 9. So God's grace was reckoned to him, verses 5 through 8. Now two mighty nations came from the loins of Abraham, fleshly Israel and spiritual Israel. Fleshly Israel was not to be the intended recipient of all of Abraham's promise. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 4, verses 13 through 16. Romans 4, verses 13 through 16. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Remember, Abraham was declared righteous while still in uncircumcision in order that he might be the father of all them that believe, not just the Jew only, but also to the Gentile. Now, the great spiritual heritage of Abraham, of course, is made possible only because it focuses on Christ. Paul said in Galatians 3, 16, Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ was really the means through who through Abraham himself had righteousness imputed unto him and to all who would become his children. Now, when we are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27, Paul says we become the children of Abraham. In verse 29, he says, If you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And what a, an amazing and tremendous privilege and joy in being an heir of the promise with Abraham. Now, Paul said in Ephesians 1, verse 3, that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. That tells me there are no spiritual blessings outside of Christ. And these blessings and promises cannot fail because they come from the God of Abraham, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it is impossible for him to lie, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. So being reconciled unto God in the one body, the church, through the cross, Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16, we have now obtained an inheritance. So being reconciled unto God... That means we have the great and precious promises that were given to Abraham. But with these blessings also come responsibilities. Our freedom from the law does not give us freedom from law. Every obligation has behind it the will of our Father which is in heaven. And the grace that brings salvation to all mankind teaches us that we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And that we are to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world while we wait for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if we truly belong to Jesus, then we will not use our freedom and our liberty in Christ as an occasion to the flesh. But through love, we will serve one another. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 13. <clears throat> Now, after Paul had contrasted the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians chapter 5, I want you to notice what he said in verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Peter also gave instructions to all who would love life and desire to see good days in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. 
To do this, he said, we have to keep our tongues from evil and deceitful speech. We must always turn away from evil and in every situation do good. We must seek and pursue peace. To do, to do this, we have to learn to be in harmony with one another. We need to learn to be sympathetic, compassionate, humble, and love one another as brethren. We can never repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but rather a blessing. Peter says to do this, then we are to inherit a blessing if we will do this. So as heirs, we receive both blessings and responsibilities. Now, the last thing I want to look at this evening is Abraham's reward. And the reason I want to look at that is because that is our hope. Now, Jesus reveals that the rich man who died there in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 and following, he looked across that great gulf that separates the heirs from the disinherited in Hades. And he saw Abraham and Lazarus in bliss. So we know from this that Abraham's faith finally brought him, him to the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to him. He had looked for a city that was built by God, Hebrews 11, verse 10. And while doing so, he produced a great nation and a messianic seed through whom all the world could be blessed. And of course, that was Jesus Christ. Abraham died in faith. And God is not ashamed to be called his God. Because of this, God had prepared for him a city in a heavenly place. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 and 16. Now, when we put Christ on in baptism, we then belong to Jesus Christ, and we become Abraham's seed. In fact, in Romans 8, verse 17, he says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So because we are Abraham's seed, then we become heirs of the promise. This is an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and one that does not fade away, and one that is reserved in heaven for us, 1 Peter 1, verse 4. God, who cannot lie, promised all of this before the world ever began, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And what a great consolation, what great refuge, what great hope and comfort, what an anchor for the soul. To know that as Abraham's seed, we can be heirs according to the promise. So what we have done this evening is we have traced the steps of Abraham all the way from his calling from the Ur of the Chaldees to his final, well not his final resting place, but where he is resting now in, Abraham, in paradise in that place of Hades. And what a pathway of obedient faith that Abraham blazed for us. So may we ever walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham, that we too might be called the friend of God and become heirs according to the promise. Now, of course, an obedient faith is a must for us to become heirs of this promise. There's a saying that I know is true. The faith that saves is the faith that obeys. If you have never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have no promise of salvation. You, know, you have no promise of that inheritance according to the promise. We must obey God in everything that he says, no matter what it may be, whether we agree with it or not. But God told us exactly what we have to do in order to inherit eternal life. We have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is God incarnate, God in the flesh, and that he is the Savior of the world. We must repent of our sins. That means to turn away from those things. If we're doing something wrong, we need to stop it. If we're not doing something right, we better start it. There needs to be a change in our life. We must confess Jesus Christ before men with our mouths to show that we're not ashamed of him. And then we must be baptized into Christ because that's where all spiritual blessings are found, are in Christ. That's where the promise of inheritance lies, in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you can't be an inheritor of the spiritual blessings. But you have that opportunity. 
something that you should never walk away from, it's something that is offered to you right now. Won't you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can have the hope of eternal life one day? Now, as a, as a child of God, maybe you have answered the call, but are you living a life that exhibits your faith before others? An obedient faith is a faith that can be seen and it's something that we do need to show others of this world. So we need to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works, but also and mostly glorify our Father which is in heaven. And if there's something that's amiss in your life, something that may not be right, something that you know you need to correct, whatever it may be, we would love to help you in whatever way we can. Maybe you need the prayers of this congregation we would be glad to play, pray with you and for you. Whatever it may be, we encourage you to respond to the invitation this evening while together we stand and sing.